And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's program, celebrating the publication of The Opposite of Loneliness, Essays and Stories by Marina Keegan, with readings by Anne Fadiman, Retna Gill, and Luke Vargas. We also want to welcome many of the friends and family of the Keegans who are joining us tonight for this special celebration. Anne Fadiman is the Francis Writer-in-Residence at Yale University and worked one-on-one -on -one with Marina as her nonfiction teacher. She is an award-winning author of several books and essays, including The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down and Ex Libris. She worked closely with Marina's parents through the publishing process and wrote the introduction to The Opposite of Loneliness. Luke Vargas became friends with Marina in 2008 while they were both in high school, and they remained close into college. In the summer of 2010, he and Marina traveled to India to study the spread of humanism. He is now a foreign affairs reporter based in the United Nations. Rena Gill is a Harvard College sophomore who saw Marina recite poetry when she visited Yale in 2011. She and Marina often exchanged emails about writing after that, and she has been highly influenced by Marina in her personal written work. Tonight, they'll be discussing Marina Keegan's posthumously published collection of essays and stories, The Opposite of Loneliness. The title essay quickly went viral after Marina's death in a car accident just four days after her graduation from Yale in 2012. This collection showcases her talent in a body of work written all by the age of 22. The Boston Globe calls her writing, quote, intimidatingly good, and continues, through these stories and essays, writers can feel the powerful reverberations of Keegan's singular voice. We're honored to have her friends and family here with us at Harvard Bookstore tonight. We'll begin by watching a video about Marina made by two of her college friends. Dearest, darlingest, momsy, and popsicle. My dear father. There's been some confusion over rooming here at Shiz. But of course I'll care for NASA. But of course I'll rise above it. For I know that's how you'd want me to respond. Yes. That was just how she was to be around in life every day. She was that funny. She was that on point all the time. In her life, she would make up, senior year really in particular, she started making up words for things that don't have names yet, words for feelings like when you get on a train and there's someone you sort of know on the train and you have to sit with them on the train for two hours and you don't really want to, or when you eat too much before you know you're gonna go out to dinner with a friend and then you're not hungry at dinner and you have to order anyway, things like that. She would make up words for things like that. Marina always seemed to, to make you feel like you were the most important person in the moment. She would just walk side by side with me, bumping into my shoulder every few paces, uh, probably bumping into people who were holding coffee or tripping over dogs on leashes. But it was a way and a sign to me that she cared the most uh, about the conversation we were having at that point. But she was still trying to figure out how to be an idealist, in what way to try and change the world, and through what means she would be able to most effectively create change. Oh, expose this black box microdrama with this clock and this scale and these three happy nouns on this big projector symbolizing the change we need and oppression of oppression. And I'll spin my words into a tie-dye mixtape of power to the people in my play, my poem, my song will make a difference. She always, even when she definitely wasn't sure of what she was doing, acted like what she said had value. And it made people sit up and take notice. So I think that the lesson that I take most from Marina is that if you believe in what you have to say, people will listen. She was willing to, to play serious when, when the circumstances demanded that, but she was also willing to, to just dream up the funkiest solutions to world problems. And I think she would have kept deploying those in her writing and making people really scratch their head about how they should be doing things. I think a lot of the results were really, really funny and, and would have been actually very useful in this world. And now I'd like to welcome Marina's father, Kevin Keegan. Hi, thank you. I'd like to thank the Harvard Bookstore 
And I certainly want to thank all of you for coming. The, uh, you know, the attention has been overwhelming. But at the end of the readings, we take questions. And last night, someone asked who Marina's favorite author was. I looked to the group, and the names came from them like J.K. Rowling and Fitzgerald, and Melville, and Keats. I thought about it and said, there are many genres, but if we're talking about Marina's favorite author, she's right here, and that's Anne Fadiman. Marina loved Anne and said her work was brilliant. Anne's love for Marina and her work has been de demonstrated to me on an almost daily basis for the past two years. She was all in on this book project from day one. To say that we could have done this book without Anne is an understatement. Boston has a large medical community, as we all know. Sitting next to Anne at bookstores, I have learned just how popular her book, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, is with doctors. I even heard required reading at some med schools by a friend from Children's. Anne is the author of At Large and At Small, in her extremely popular national bestseller, Ex Libris, she says that reading aloud is a performance, a collaboration between the writer and the reader. So let me bring on the orchestrator of the performance. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you Anne Fadiman. Thank you, Kevin. When people die, they become flattened. Three-dimensional living people are converted by their obituaries into two-dimensional angels. And what I hope the video just saw did for you and what all of us hope to do for you tonight is restore Marina's three dimensions. I had the privilege of teaching her when she was a junior at Yale, and she was brilliant, and she was idealistic, and she was energetic, and she was vivid, and she was hardworking, but she was also a procrastinator, and she was messy. Uh, she was capable of losing her keys and her cell phone inside her bag. <laughs> She could do that only because there were so many papers and books and pencils and pens also inside that bag, which amazingly did not have a zipper, even though one would expect anyone as entropic as Marina to choose a zippered bag. But in her fashion accessories, as in everything else in her life, her hallmark was openness. I say in the introduction that if you wanted a smooth ride, Marina was not your vehicle. In a couple of minutes, you're going to hear Luke Vargas read a marvelous essay she wrote about her actual vehicle. But I would say that Marina's metaphoric vehicle, the way I always felt when I was in her presence, was an open convertible, going along in a high-speed wind, whipping in that long hair, um, so that she could be an entirely um, present part of the world. Um, no walls, no windows rolled up. She's published by Scribner, the publisher of Hemingway and Fitzgerald, two of Marina's favorite writers, whom she is outselling at the moment by far. <laughs> If you look at the nonfiction bestseller list at the back of the New York Times book review this coming Sunday, you will see the opposite of loneliness in position number nine. Marina wanted to make a difference in the world, and when I got to know Tracy and Kevin, her parents, I understood where her heart came from. I've learned a great deal from them. I've learned, first of all, about forgiveness. If you are a parent as I am, imagine what it would be like to lose your daughter 
Imagine then embracing the boyfriend who fell asleep at the wheel of the car in which she died, literally embracing him, taking him for long walks on the beach, telling him he needed to go on with his life, literally standing by his side when he went to court. So few of us would be able to do that. And when I saw the resolute, um, intuitive, non-intellectual, just of course kind of forgiveness that Kevin and Tracy showed to Michael, I understood much of why Marina came to be who she was. When young people die, our hearts break because of what they might have done. But tonight we are celebrating what Marina had already done, had already done at 22, written more than enough, than enough, beautifully written, vivid, powerful, confidently voiced prose to fit between the covers of this book. You'll get the first taste of it from her friend Luke. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, as someone who shared a lot of jokes with Marina, I want to piggyback on something Anne said, which was about the sales of her book. When I last checked on Amazon, uh, I think last week, um, she was outselling Divergent, The Bible, and Bill O'Reilly, something I think <laughs> she would have uh, been endlessly, uh, <laughs> endlessly uh, entertained by. Um, you know, at the uh, risk of breaking one of Marina's uh, writing rules, which is uh, featured in the introduction to the book, that uh, don't get too attached to anything you write because it only took a minute to compose it, I am going to repeat myself a little bit from the things I've said the past few nights. Um, I had a chance to uh, meet Marina in high school. I can see a few high school friends here, uh, as well as teachers, including the English teacher that we shared uh, on two occasions. Um, we did not go to the same school together, uh, though she was very close with people at Yale, as many of you could uh, you know, see in her writing. Uh, but even while going to different schools, we remained really close. And uh, after my freshman year, she applied for, or uh, was, well, I guess during her sophomore year, was applying for uh, a number of grants through Yale to uh, embark on a summer research project. Um, I knew this was going to be successful, that she was going to get whatever she applied for, so I knew I should listen very carefully about the places she was uh, suggesting we travel to. And the fact that I was included in this plan was uh, pretty remarkable in and of itself because this was for one person to travel. And uh, Marina being very crafty, I would not say she was a, a rule breaker necessarily or, or a cheater, but she certainly <laughs> knew how to game the system uh, for, to great result and applied for just enough money to pay the way for two people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she got I, all these awards, and, and to the best of my knowledge, Yale never knew that uh, this happened. They were very, <laughs> very impressed with our written work and everything we uh, she came up with in India. Uh, and you know, I think that anecdote is, is very illustrative of who Marina was. Um, in the past few weeks, as is inevitable, I think when someone passes away, with uh, particularly with this much. Media attention, um, there is a lot of compression of personality. There uh, are a lot of repetition of, of certain themes that play well with journalists. And as a journalist, I'm sort of disappointed to, to some extent that there wasn't a little more digging, you know, um, that of all the articles written that Tracy and, and Kevin didn't receive more phone calls, that there wasn't more probing of the various people in her life. Um, but I hope that in reading uh, what I'm about to read, which is an essay she wrote uh, in her freshman year at Yale, a piece of nonfiction, uh, you can help reclaim a little bit of, of Marina's sharp edges at times. Uh, her doggedness and her persistence have been a lot of times just sort of watered down into a more universal curiosity. Her uh, incomparable loyalty is replaced just with a general caring for others. It was much deeper than that. Uh, and on the topic of sort of how a writer actually lives, how a very successful student actually lives. This story, Stability in Motion, I think adds a little bit of color to who she actually was. This is Stability in Motion. My 1990 Camry's DNA was designed inside the metallic walls of the Toyota Multinational Corporation's headquarters in Tokyo, Japan transported via blueprint to the North American Manufacturing Nerve Center in Hebron, Kentucky, 
grown organ by organ in four major assembly plants in Alabama, New Jersey, Texas, and New York, trucked to 149 Arsenals, Arsenal Street in Watertown, Massachusetts, and steered home by my grandmother on September 4th, 1990. It featured a 200 horsepower, three liter V6 engine, a four speed automatic, and an adaptive variable suspension system. She deemed the car too high tech. In 1990, this meant a cassette player, a cup holder, and a manually operated moonroof. <laughs> During its youth, the car traveled little. In 15 years, my grandmother accumulated a meager 25,000 miles, mostly to and from the market, my family's house and the Greek jewelry store downtown. The black exterior remained glossy and spotless. The beige interior crisp and pristine. Tissues were disposed of, seats vacuumed, and food prohibited. My grandmother's old-fashioned cleanliness was an endearing virtue, one that I, evidently, did not inherit. <laughs> I acquired the old Camry through an awkward transaction. Ten days before my 16th birthday, my grandfather died. He was 86, and it had long been expected. Yet, I still felt a guilty unease when I heard the now surplus car would soon belong to me. For my grandmother, it was a symbolic goodbye. She needed to see only one car in her garage, needed to comprehend her loss more tangibly. Grandpa's car was the nicer of the two, so that one she would keep. Three weeks after the funeral, my grandmother and I went to the bank, and I signed a check for exactly one dollar, and the car was legally mine. That was that. When I drove her home that evening, I manually opened the moonroof and put on a tape of Frank Sinatra. My grandmother smiled for the first time in weeks. Throughout the next three years, the car evolved. When I first parked the Toyota in my driveway, it was spotless, full of gas, and equipped with my grandmother's version of survival necessities. The glove compartment had a magnifying glass, three pens, and the registration in a little Ziploc bag. The trunk had two matching black umbrellas, a first aid kit, and a miniature sewing box for emergency repairs. <laughs> like my grandmother's wrists, everything smelled of opium perfume. <coughs> for a while, I maintained this immaculate condition, yet one Wrigley's wrapper led to two, and soon enough, my car underwent a radical transformation, the vehicular equivalent of a midlife crisis. Born and raised, in proper formality, the car saw me as that friend, from school, the bad example who washes away naivete and corrupts the clean and the innocent. We were the same age, after all, both 18. The Toyota was born again, crammed with clutter and exposed to decibel levels it had never fathomed. I filled it with giggling friends and emotional phone calls, borrowed skirts and bottled drinks. The messiness crept up on me. Parts of my life began falling off, forming an eclectic debris that dribbled gradually into every corner. Empty sushi containers, Diet Coke cans, half full packs of gum, sweaters, sweatshirts, socks, and my running shoes. My clutter was non-discriminatory. I had every variety of newspaper, scratched up English paper, biology review sheet, and Spanish flashcard discarded on the seats after I'd sufficiently studied on my way to school. <laughs> The left door pocket was filled with tiny tinfoil balls, crumpled after consuming my morning English muffin. By Friday, I had the entire house's supply of portable coffee mugs. <laughs> By Sunday, someone always complained about their absence, and I would rush out, grab them all, and surreptitiously place them in the dishwasher. My car was not gross. It was occupied, cluttered, cramped. It became an extension of my bedroom, and thus an extension of myself. I had two bumper stickers on the back, the symbol for the Equal Rights Campaign and Republicans for Voldemort. <laughs> on average, I spent two hours a day driving. It was nearly an hour each way to school, and the old-fashioned Toyota, regarded with lighthearted amusement by my classmates, came to be a place of comfort and solitude amid the chaos. My mind was free to wander, my muscles to relax, no one was watching or keeping score. Sometimes I let the deep baritone of NPR's Tom Ashbrook lecture me on oil shortages. Other times I played repetitive mixtapes 
with titles like Pancake Breakfast, Tie-Dye Granola, and songs for the highway when it's snowing. I talked a lot in my car. Thousands of words and songs and swears are absorbed in its fabric, just like the orange juice I spilled on my way to the dentist. It knows what happened when Allie went to Puerto Rico, understands the difference between the way I look at Nick and the way I look at Adam, and remembers the first time I experimented with talking to myself. I've practiced for auditions, college interviews, Spanish oral presentations, and debates. There's something novel about swearing alone in the car. Yet with the pressures of APs and SATs and the other acronyms that haunt high school, the act became more frequent and less refreshing. My car has seen three drive-in movies. During the dark night, its battery died, and giggling ferociously, we had to ask the overweight family in the next row to jump it. The smell of popcorn permeated every crevice of the sedan, and all rides for the next week were like a trip to the movies. There was a variety of smells in the Camry. At first, it smelled like my grandmother, perfume, mint, and mothballs. I went through a chai tea phase, during which my car smelled incessantly of Indian herbs. Some mornings, it would smell slightly of tobacco, and I would know immediately that my older brother had kidnapped it the night before. For exactly three days, it reeked of marijuana. Dan had removed the shabbily rolled joint from behind his ear, and our fingers had trembled as the five of us apprehensively inhaled. Nothing happened. Only the seats seemed to absorb the plant and get high. <laughs> Mostly, however, it smelled like nothing to me. Yet when I drove my friends, they always said it had a distinct aroma. I believe this functioned in the same way as not being able to taste your own saliva or smell your own odor. The car and I were pleasantly immune to each other. In the Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols high school yearbook, I was voted worst driver. <laughs> but on most days, I will refute this superlative. My car's love for parking tickets made me an easy target, but I rarely received other violations. My mistakes mostly harmed me, not others. Blocking my keys in the car, or parking on the wrong side of the road. Once last winter, I needed to refill my windshield wiper fluid, and in a rushed frenzy, poured an entire bottle of similarly blue antifreeze inside. <laughs> Antifreeze, it turns out, burns out engines if used in excess. I spent the next two hours driving circles around my block in a snowstorm, urgently expelling the antifreeze, squirt by thick blue squirt. I played no music during this vigil. I couldn't find a playlist called Poisoning Your Car. My younger brother entered high school last September, and I passed my ownership on to him. In the weeks before I left for college, my parents made me clean it out for his sake. I spread six trash bags over the driveway, filling them with my car's contents as the August sun heated their black plastic. The task was strange, like deconstructing a scrapbook, unpeeling all the pictures, and whiting out the captions. Just like for my grandmother, it was a symbolic goodbye. Standing outside my newly vacuumed car, I wondered, if I tried hard enough, whether I could smell the opium perfume, or if I searched long enough, whether I'd find the matching umbrellas and the tiny sewing kit. My brother laughed at my nostalgia, reminding me I could still drive the car when I came home. He didn't understand that it wasn't the driving I'd miss, that it was the tinfoil balls, the New York Times, and the broken speaker, the fingernail marks, the stray cassettes, and the smell of chai. Alone that night and parked in my driveway, I listened to Frank Sinatra with the moon roof slid back. I'm going to read from Song for the Special, an essay Marina wrote in my class. Every generation thinks it's special. As they remember World War II, my parents because of discos and the moon. We have the internet. 
Millions and billions of doors we can open and shut, posting ourselves into profiles and digital scrapbooks. Suddenly and totally, we're threaded together in a network so terrifyingly colossal that we can finally see our terrifyingly tiny place in it. But we're all individuals. It's beaten into us in MLK Day assemblies. One person can make a difference. And fourth grade poster projects. What do you want to be when you grow up? We can be anything. Vaguely, quietly, we know we'll be famous for being president, for starring in a movie, for writing a feature at 18 in the New York Times. I'm so jealous. Unthinkable jealousies, jealousies of the Pulitzer Prize winning novel I'm reading and the Oscar winning movie I just saw. Why didn't I think to rewrite Mrs. Dalloway? <laughs> I should have thought to chronicle a schizophrenic ballerina. <laughs> It's inexcusable. Everyone else is so successful, and I hate them. I blame the internet, its inconsiderate inclusion of everything. Success is transparent and accessible, hanging down where it can tease but not touch us. We talk into these scratchy microphones and take extra photographs, but I still feel like there are just so many people. Every day, 1,035.6 books are published. 66 million people update their status each morning. I went to an arts conference in Manhattan last spring, and everyone was scrambling to meet everyone, asserting their individuality like sad salesmen. This is my idea, I would say. This is my thing. We stood in cocktail circles and exchanged earnest interest. Woohoo! Open spaces, oh yes, the avant-garde. I didn't have a business card. It didn't even occur to me. It might have been funny or endearing, but I ended up just being embarrassed. I don't have one, I'd say again and again. Ha ha. <laughs> then I'd sit down for another panel to take notes and nod. There were so many people there, there were just so many The thing is, someday the sun is going to die and everything on earth will freeze. This will happen, even if we end global warming and clean up our radiation. The complete works of William Shakespeare, Monet's Lilies, all of Hemingway, all of Milton, all of Keats, our music libraries, our library libraries, our galleries, our poetry, our letters, our names etched in desks. I used to think that printing things made them permanent, but that seems so silly now. Everything will be destroyed no matter how hard we work to create it. You can be anything, they tell us. No one else is quite like you. But I searched my name on Facebook and got eight tiny pictures staring back. <laughs> the Marina Keegans with their little hometowns and relationship statuses. <laughs> When we die, our gravestones will match. Here lies Marina Keegan, they will say. Numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sometimes I think about what it would be like if there was actually peace. The whole planet would be super sustainable Windmills everywhere, solar panel dubops, clean streets. Before the world freezes and goes dark, it would be perfect. The generation flying its tiny cars would think itself special. Until one day, vaguely, quietly, the sun would flicker out and they'd realize that none of us are. Or that all of us are. I read somewhere that radio waves just keep traveling outward, flying into the universe with eternal vibrations. Sometime before I die, I think I'll find a microphone and climb to the top of a radio tower. 
I'll take a deep breath and close my eyes because it will start to rain right when I reach the top. Hello, I'll say to outer space, this is my card. I'm Ratna and I'm a sophomore here at Harvard. The first and only time I saw Marina was when I visited Yale as a senior in high school, giddily excited about the prospect of being in college but also experimenting with my newly found nonchalance towards societal expectation, authority, and respect. So I was only half listening as she recited one of her pieces. I sat on the floor in a corner with a friend whom I'd come to see perform and we whispered over her spoken word poem. When Marina apologized for the fact that she hadn't practiced it in a while and would be reading it off of her laptop, he and I grinned at each other. But somewhere in there, I started listening. Her words about all of the glee and nostalgia associated with being a junior in college were stunningly similar to what I was going through as an almost high school undergraduate, uh, graduate, sorry, and I had to silence my cynical friend to have more of a listen. By the end of it, I was touched, but I still hadn't heard it all but the poem stuck with me for months. I emailed my friend at Yale quite a while later and asked him to find her name and send me her address. I got in touch with her and asked her to send me a copy of Bygones. She responded with a poem and asked me if I was coming to Yale the following year. I told her I was choosing between Yale and Harvard and her immediate response was, what's your phone number? I'm gonna call you and convince <laughs> you to come to Yale. <laughs> I made the usual high school excuses of homework in no time, but emailed her my number and asked her to call me over the weekend. She called right that second. <laughs> what followed was a breathless two-minute call of Marina Energy, and listen, I'm walking to class and I'm in college, so I don't have time to talk either, but if you care at all about the arts or poetry or having fun, you have to come here and not Harvard. Talk to me. <laughs> she blew me away. She was the single factor that made it hardest for me to pick Harvard. When I emailed her to let her know I'd made my choice, she responded with a beautiful, Harvard is despicable, but perhaps less so for your attainment. <laughs> in the same email, I told her how bygones continue to inspire and illuminate even the most confusing moments of emotional crisis. And she replied, I can't tell you sincerely enough how much it means to me that my poetry has helped you. It's really an ultimate goal of mine, and I'm so happy you can relate to some of my concerns and anxieties and quandaries and happinesses. Her writing continues to do the same for me now, and I can't overstate how influential it has been on my outlook on a daily basis. I'm so happy that I now have a whole book of it for those moments, and I'm so grateful to have met Tracy Keegan last year and to be working with the Keegan family and their friends on this book tour. Today I'll be reading The Opposite of Loneliness, the essay after which Marina's book is named, which she submitted as a commencement speech before graduating from Yale. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I could say that's what I want in life. What I'm grateful and thankful to have found at Yale and what I'm scared of losing when we wake up tomorrow after commencement and leave this place. It's not quite love, and it's not quite community. It's just this feeling that there are people, an abundance of people, who are in this together, who are on your team. When the check is paid and you stay at the table. When it's 4 a.m. and no one goes to bed. That night with the guitar. That night we can't remember. That time, we did, we went, we saw, we laughed, we felt. The hats. <coughs> Yale is full of tiny circles we pull around ourselves. A cappella groups, sports teams, houses, societies, clubs. These tiny groups that make us feel loved and safe and part of something, even on our loneliest nights when we stumble home to our computers. Partnerless, tired, awake. We won't have those next year. We won't live on the same block as all our friends. We won't have a bunch of group texts. This scares me. More than finding the right job or city or spouse, I'm scared of losing this web we're in. <coughs> this elusive, indefinable opposite of loneliness. This feeling I feel right now. But let us get one thing straight. 
The best years of our lives are not behind us. They're part of us and they're set for repetition as we grow up and move to New York and away from New York and wish we did or didn't live in New York. <laughs> I plan on having parties when I'm 30. I plan on having fun when I'm old. Any notion of the best years comes from cliched, should have, if I, wish I. Of course, there are things we wish we'd done. Our readings, <laughs> that boy across the hall. <laughs> We're our own hardest critics and it's easy to let ourselves down. Sleeping too late, procrastinating, cutting corners. More than once I've looked back on my high school self and thought, how did I do that? How did I work so hard? Our private insecurities follow us and will always follow us. But the thing is, we're all like that. Nobody wakes up when they want to. Nobody did all of their reading. Except maybe the crazy people who win the prizes. <laughs> we have these impossibly high standards and we'll probably never live up to our perfect fantasies of our future selves. But I feel like that's okay. We're so young. We're so young. We're 22 years old. We have so much time. There's this sentiment I sometimes sense creeping in our collective conscious as we lie alone after a party or pack up our books when we give in and go out, that it is somehow too late, that others are somehow ahead, more accomplished, more specialized, more on the path to somehow saving the world, somehow creating or inventing or improving, that it's too late now to begin a beginning and we must settle for continuance, for commencement. When we came to Yale, there was this sense of possibility, this immense and indefinable potential energy. And it's easy to feel like that slipped away. We never had to choose and suddenly we've had to. Some of us have focused ourselves. Some of us know exactly what we want and are on the path to get it. Already going to med school, working at the perfect NGO, doing research. To you I say both congratulations and you suck. <laughs> For most of us, however, we're somewhat lost in this sea of liberal arts not quite sure what road we're on and whether we should have taken it. If only I'd majored in biology. If only I'd gotten involved in journalism as a freshman. If only I'd thought to apply for this or for that. But what we have to remember is that we can still do anything. We can change our minds. We can start over. Get a post back or try writing for the first time. The notion that it's too late to do anything is comical. It's hilarious. We're graduating from college. We're so young. We can't, we must not lose this sense of possibility because in the end, it's all we have. In the heart of a winter Friday night my freshman year, I was dazed and confused when I got a call from my friends to meet them at Est Est Est, the pizza place. Dazedly and confusedly, I began trudging to SSS, Sheffield Sterling Strathcona Hall, probably the point on campus farthest away. Remarkably, it wasn't until I arrived at the door that I questioned how and why exactly my friends were partying in Yale's administrative building. <laughs> of course they weren't, but it was cold and somehow my ID worked, so I went inside SSS to pull out my phone. It was quiet, the old wood creaking and the snow barely visible outside the stained glass. And I sat down and I looked up at this giant room I was in at this place where thousands of people had sat before me. And alone at night, in the middle of a New Haven storm, I felt so remarkably, unbelievably safe. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I'd say that's how I feel at Yale, how I feel right now, here, with all of you. In love, impressed, humble, scared and we don't have to lose that. We're in this together, 2012. Let's make something happen to this world. So I think you know all of us except for Tracy Keegan. Um, actually, some of you know Tracy extremely well. Tracy. Um, is Marina's mother, <laughs> and Beth McNamara, who was Marina's beloved high school English teacher. Does anybody have any questions about Marina or this book? Who wants to be first? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Um, did, it, did it 
In some ways, yes. I mean, it's been a roller coaster of emotions. Having Marina's friends involved has made it, uh, you know, a consolation of sorts. But, uh, but the hearing from people who've been affected by the book has been wonderful. Uh, from all over the world, we've had responses and letters and emails. People have change jobs to do things that are, you know, more, uh, you know, from a, you know, NGO, you know, to, uh, you know, helping people perspective. We've had people do things that they've always wanted to do, but just never thought that they, they would. And they, you know, read, it's never too late to change your mind to do something different. And so that's, that's been good. That was actually the compelling, um, the the compelling reason for us uh, in the depths of uh, you know our dark days after Melina died to actually uh, all of the responses we got from everywhere, all over the you know world basically, were what gave us the idea and also the motive, the strength to gather up all of our words with huge huge uh, help from uh, after much shameless begging on my part <laughs> from um, her, both of her mentors, you know, and Fatiman at Yale and Beth, Ma Beth McNamara uh, from right here in Cambridge at the <coughs> um, And they were able to help us to sort through all of the things that Marina had written in all of the different areas and, and pull them all together. And we very much deferred to their, their professional opinion about what Marina would have wanted to have go in the book. And so that's how we started. Are there some essays in the book that you wrote in high school? There are th three. Um, two short stories and one essay. The um, piece of nonfiction is an absolutely hilarious profile of an exterminator called I Kill for Money. <laughs> um, and uh, the really beautifully crafted personal essay about Marina's car that Luke uh, uh, read. Uh, she wrote when she was a freshman in college, so uh, much of this stuff she wrote when she was still in her teens. I was just wondering what kinds of things she likes to write about in high school. In, in the profile, you know, each student, you know, was going to follow a, a person in their, in their job for a day, and Marina was trying to figure out who she was going to follow, and she said, who do you know? And, some people were going to be following, like Keith Lockhart of the Boston Pops, or the Governor, and you know. So you know, we had an exterminator, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, but actually, she settled on the exterminator, who was quite a, a funny guy, um, and uh, she won the first prize with the uh, "I Kill for Money." <laughs> Beth, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, Marina's writing in high school? Well, the fabulous part is also the, the profile is something that uh, multiple reviewers have mentioned, and I just think, you know, tee she was 17 when she wrote that. Uh, but she did a little bit of everything. She was writing uh, standard analytical papers. She wrote one for me on Reading in the Dark about fire imagery and had singed the top of the paper when she turned it in. <laughs> she wrote a piece about her alarm clock uh, based on Roger Angel's On the Ball, talking about baseball, both the, the physical elements of it as well as the essence of it. She wrote about her alarm clock, everything from the plastic shell to the need to sleep and to dream. And I've read it to multiple students, and they just listen, um, struck by every aspect of it. Uh, and she wrote an emulation of Michael Andachi's The English Patient that I swear Andachi himself would have read and thought, I don't remember writing that, but it's mine. Uh, for people who know the book, there's a character, Caravaggio, a, a thief who's lost his thumbs. And she just had this lovely line about the doorknobs jeering at him. So she was delightful. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about the process of um, putting it together, and in particular, at what points you know, things was it all finished work before you put it in the book? Are there any drafts? What got left on the before? Well, firstly, Scribner is uh, was interested only in fiction and nonfiction. So all of the liter literary criticism w was, you know, not going to be in, and that, you know, kind of broke 
Harold Bloom's heart, who was a, uh, a mentor of, of hers as well. But then, uh, well, and she also wrote a lot of poetry, some of which you can uh, see if you go to the website, theoppositeofloneliness.com. Um, and uh, also, she, because thank God for YouTube, um, they recorded several of her performances. You saw a little bit of one there. Um, and they're basically all on if you just, you know, go there and you can hear Marina reciting her word poems. Um, we were able to convince Scribner to put a couple of lines from there in. And the other thing that she wrote, uh, or things that she wrote, uh, were two plays, one of which she was actually going to be working on when she was driving down to the Cape, uh, which was Independence, which was a musical that was um, performed at the New York uh, Playwriting Festival and Fringe Festival. And it actually, um, you know, after she died, they still went on with the show, and which we asked them to. And it was actually listed as a critic's pick in the New York Times, and it, it was one of the winners of the Best in Show. However, my favorite piece of writing of hers, which hopefully we will get out to all of you, is actually called Utility Monster, which is a play that my daughter wrote um, when she literally was, she would use her writing to explore her own feelings about the world and to try and understand and to try and tease out her own choices and to just to realize what was more important to her. So this entire play, Utility Monster, is really a matter of her analyzing her, her love and her passion for art, you know, the art of writing and playwriting and, you know, it's sort of a, you know, ironic play about is this play worth it, um, you know, versus how can I justify spending my life doing that when there are people out there who are still starving. And it's um, actually really amusing. She didn't tell the story, didn't work things out without humor. But so we're looking forward to getting that out in the future. It's, it's you know, it just, you know, hilarious, the play. But it, as Ann, you know, said one time, you know, she'll turn on a dime and break your heart. I mean, so she brings out so much emotion in, uh, in her work. How old was she when you realized she was that remarkable? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was reading Shakespeare to her when she I was pregnant, no. <laughs> to be or not to be. Um, I don't know. I mean, she's my child, so she was my daughter. She just was my daughter, you know. So, I, you know, it's hard because when you're inside of it, looking at her, she's like, yeah, you're, you know, you're a great kid. Hey, you're getting a little weird. Move back into the middle. <laughs> <laughs> she was always a lot of fun. And uh, she was. Uh, you know, she, she had, had a great lot of imagination. She had a great imagination. We used to, you know, make up stories all the time in the car. You know, people have asked, you know, what did you read to her when she was young? And Tracy you know, did, you know, a lot of reading. <laughs> but we made up a lot of stories as well. When we were in the car, we were on chairlifts and, you know, in jacuzzis and hot tubs. And uh, when we were on NPR, you know, the uh, the woman said. Everyone in the car in the back seat, turn off those, you know, TV monitors. And but uh, so I think the creativity uh, that she had started very early. She. Uh, she I believe that, that you, unless you do a lot of reading, it's going to be difficult to do good writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things. And my big goal with all my children was to try and get them uh, to love and embrace reading, you know, and it's always a balance. She was actually a facile reader, but a couple of my kids, you know, one of my children wasn't a facile reader, and it was like, thank you, J.K. Rowling. <laughs> I was like, write faster, write faster. Um, but, you know, so pretty much, you know, she just loved it. That was, it really was a form for her of um, analyzing her own life. Oh, maybe this is like a question for Luke. What drew Marina to India, and how did that affect her writing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it was the uh, the subject matter first and foremost. I know, and I think the the actual prospects of traveling to India alone for her probably gave her the the creeps a little bit. I mean, no, not I, really. <laughs> but but that's it why gave I was her mother the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, 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 uh, no, not by yourself. But uh, the topic matter that she was there to study, which was uh, humanism in a country that is very religious, I think uh, was what brought her there. Um, it's funny because right behind you is the humanist chaplain at Harvard who we actually coordinated with uh, for that trip. And, um, you know, again, more than the subject of that, I think, you know, why Marina probably tried to get me to come was that I think she realized you know, having a little bit more comfort to be able to do her research, a little bit more physical safety would allow her to actually do better work. And even though Yale really 
was trying to emphasize the, the personal exploration, she was very conscious of the fact that she could do everyone uh, a better service by putting out better work. And I think uh, what she was able to do there, the writing she put together, has been very useful um, for the humanist community here, here, here in the United States. And as far as what we've heard from the folks in India who still remain in touch with me, and probably with Greg, it's had like a, a big impact there for a you know community that was sort of on the decline. It uh, showed that the world was still interested in, in what was happening in that country. So that's a little bit of my insight. But I, you know, she called me up one night and said India was the place, right. and I sort of had to well, go along with it. She wrote a she wrote a paper uh, that talked about you know that you needed to be affiliated with a particular uh, religious. Uh, you know, uh, order or group in order to be president of the United States. And uh, she didn't like that. And so she wanted to go explore humanism and go to India where there were so many different, you know, religions <coughs> all in one particular area. And uh, she started her own spiritual journey, uh, you know, as, as part of that. I've heard a couple people describe the, the trip as life-changing for her, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in retrospect. What was the change? What 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 was what was ultimately the significance of the trip for her? I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say. Well, also. let's get the perspectives <laughs> from the parents. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will say. What she's told me is that you know, there's one incident where we were in, in Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lives. And um, I, I think I was dehydrated and I sort of passed out on the street. Um, and I was with uh, Adam Friedman, who we met there also. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, she basically was thinking I was, I believe that I was dying because I wasn't waking up right away. She was like, slapping my face and kissing my forehead. And when I came to, she was on the ground and there were all these people around me. And then I got up after a few minutes and, and hobbled across the street and then passed out again. And I woke up with these the, ten monks around me rubbing my uh, legs because they're apparently preparing me for, for death. I mean, like, <laughs> and, and they were preventing her from staying close to me because if she touched a woman touched the body, it would prevent me from going to heaven. Or I mean, uh, so uh, she told me that something about that moment and feeling like her death was imminent and that uh, she had precious few moments left on the earth did have a major effect on her, and I know she talked to Adam and myself about this. So again, that's why I don't feel terribly confident uh, actually explaining what the change was. But, uh, you know, uh, that incident, among others, probably yeah, I, I didn't get to hear all those details. Um, I would say that Marina was hugely drawn to India when she had gone back and called to her. It kept calling her back, and one of the things she said to me and she came to Wayland, which is our little suburb, you know, half hour west of Austin, and she goes, there's so much space here. Because India, she goes, but the energy in India, where this would be considered a lot of open space with all of us standing like we are, the unbelievable energy of the humanity there and how wonderful and kind they were when she got over the fact that they all wanted to do portraits of her, um, you know, which she eventually liked and you hated. Um, but basically she kept being drawn to this unbelievable human energy that she felt in India. Yours is more truthful. <laughs> I don't know. She had a lot of compassion before she left and I think it was only increased by, uh, by traveling there. It was hard for her. I, read, I was able to read her journals, I'm sure she would hate me for that, but I did, um, after she died. And, and in her journals, she was very much, she was far more mindful than I think I ever realized. Um, and I think it was a lesson that I've learned to become more mindful myself. Because when she was traveling at 20 in India, she was like, I have to make sure that I am present while I'm there and really experience being there and really understand what it means to be someone who at three years old is holding my one-year-old brother wearing only you know a t-shirt and nothing else and be really engaged in that experience and I asked her after she came back where she came back whatever six seven weeks and I said so Marina now you should have a whole bunch of other stuff that you can write about because you you know gone to a buffet and tried different flavors of food <laughs> and she basically looked at me and she says mother I could never I would never feel right writing about any place that I had only spent seven weeks in. Mm -hmm. How could I really know what their reality is? And I really respected yeah. her for yeah. that. But she taught in an orphanage for two weeks and stayed in hostels. I mean, this wasn't a uh, 
you know, a typical travel, you know, tour of India. It was, uh, went to a humanist conference, interviewed all different types of people. So it was well thought out and it was a good plan. And uh, she wasn't going by herself. We needed Luke there, definitely. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Who were Marina's favorite poets? Well, she loved Shakespeare, Milton. Keats. 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 T.S. Eliot. Um, I know because the book cracks open <laughs> from where she was reading them. Um, yeah. Some of the transcendentalists. Right. And you should uh, watch her uh, your performance poetry online if uh, if you like that. It's uh, it's something that I enjoyed and. We got to go a few times, and then she wouldn't tell us about all of them. <laughs> so we'd have to watch them online, too. Like, are we that embarrassing? We can't yeah. even be in the audience. <laughs> Apparently, yes. And in the performances, you get to see her react to an audience, um, which she would have loved this assemblage tonight. She would have. It was her dream yeah. to be a published author. It was. So. Thank you for helping to make it come true. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.